Well, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I want to start by taking you back right to the beginning, the young Vint. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I was earning money mowing lawns and washing cars, but you were working on the Apollo program. That's right. Uh, this was, uh, you talk about a charmed life uh, where uh, you, you can't plan these things. Sometimes they just happen. My father worked for a company that uh, was called North American Aviation. He was in the personnel department uh, doing management training. Uh, that company uh, had a number of subsidiaries, one of which was a company called Rocketdyne. They made the F-1 engines for the Apollo program. And when I was in, uh, just had just graduated from high school, I was 18 years old, and I got to go and help with the testing of the F-1 engines. This was in uh, north of Los Angeles. Uh, there was a place called the Simi Valley in the Santa Susana Mountains, and we mounted this F-1 engine in a test frame, one and a half million pounds of thrust per engine. There were five on the uh, Apollo spacecraft, the Saturn V rocket, the first stage. And so we would fire that thing off uh, in the you know, sort of late hours at night. Of course, the hills would all light up, and I would be pulling all the data off of this and then writing programs to analyze the spacecraft or the, uh, the rocket's uh, performance. And the whole idea here was we didn't care whether the thing fell apart. And, uh, we only wanted to make sure it didn't do that until after it ran out of fuel. <laughs> and then after that, we didn't care. Now, I have an Australian story to tell you about that test period. This is back in 1961. Uh, many, many years later, a man named Paul Toomey, who used to live here in Sydney and still has a home here, uh, became the CEO of a company called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, where I happened to be the chairman. And I came here to visit uh, Paul and met his father. Paul, Paul's father and mother and Paul moved to the Simi Valley, uh, an Antelope Valley area, uh, in order to teach science and mathematics uh, during the post um, Sputnik period, because when the Sputnik was launched by the Russians in October of 57, the Americans went crazy. How did this happen? How could they get ahead of us? And so they started a vast program of science and technology education, and they invited people to come and teach. So Paul's father was teaching mathematics in the area uh, not far away from where we were testing those engines. And so when I had, I don't remember how the subject came up, but I mentioned that I had done this work, and he erupted from his chair, this is Paul's father, saying, you're the one who did that. That damn engine was firing at late hours at night. It kept me awake and everything. So <laughs> you know, who knew? So uh, there's a, you know, that formed a special bond between uh -huh. Paul's father and me after that. Has he forgiven you yet? Uh, the gentleman has now passed away, uh -huh. but I think before, before that, we agreed over a glass of beer that it was probably okay that we did that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway, had, sorry for the long story. It, but it yeah. had a good ending, right? We got to the moon and back then. Uh, was that the first computer you used? I mean, I, I still remember my first computer. It Actually, it was not the first computer that I used. My best friend managed is Steve Crocker, who also eventually became chairman of ICANN, just to show you how tangled everything is. Uh, he got permission while we were still in high school to use computers at UCLA. You know, we went to high school in the San Fernando Valley, which is a little north of LA. And uh, this is Van Nuys High School. And for those of you who are history buffs, there were some other interesting people that went to that high school, in addition to Steve Cocker and me, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Robert <laughs> Redford, uh, Stacy Keach, uh, John, uh, Don Drysdale, Natalie Wood. You know, it was an amazing, that was a bedroom community for Hollywood, it turns out. Now, I wasn't there when they were there. They were a little before <laughs> my time. Anyway, so Steve got permission to use the computers at UCLA. And in particular, we got to use one called a Bendix G15. Now, those of you who didn't happen to grow up in America might not know that Bendix was a company that made washing machines. But they also made this computer. It was driven by paper tape. It was used for numerical control. So if you had a drilling machine or something and you wanted to do, make many things over and over and over again, you could program it with this paper tape to, to do that. So we got to program 
this paper tape machine. You typed the program in and the paper tape was punched out and then you fed the paper tape into the machine and then you waited for a while and then the paper tape came back out again and you put that back in the Flexo writer and it would print out the answers. So uh, one night uh, we went there and we calculated how long it was going to take to do the computation. It was a uh, transcendental equation. And, uh, and we estimated also how much tape should come out. So we went out to get a pizza. And we came back and, and there was about a foot and a half of tape out. And we thought, oh, you know, many bad words. You know, the program hadn't run properly. And then I, for reasons I don't remember, we opened up the door of the computer and discovered that the tape was inside. It had kinked in the little uh, channel that was supposed to come out, so we had about a quarter of a mile of tape inside the machine. So we got a pencil and we rolled it all up, stuck it into the Flexo writer and printed out our answer. So that was the first machine I got the program, but by the time I got to doing the uh, probability distributions for uh, the engine uh, uh, failures, um, I was using a, uh, an IBM machine and uh, writing programs in Fortran. So uh, it, was, uh, it was just the most wonderful combination of space and computing. I mean, you, you, you can't imagine how much fun that was because I was thinking, you know, it's 1960, 61, and I'm thinking 20 years from now we'll be launching these things every two weeks and we'll have, um, you know, uh, some, a habitat on the moon. And, you know, I was reading science fiction at the time. Of course, 20 years later, it's 1981, and no such thing happened. So what this tells you is that the future doesn't happen as fast as you would like. Until you get really old like I am now, and now it happens too fast, but that's a different problem. So, so let's fast forward to the future that you did invent, right. which was the, the internet. So that, the first question is, probably not many people, is why is it the internet? So uh, the original work that was done prior to the internet uh, was a single network that was called the ARPANET for the simple reason that the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency sponsored this network to be built to connect a bunch of heterogeneous computers together. Why would they do this? Well, ARPA, the Information Processing Techniques Office of ARPA, was very interested in artificial intelligence and general computer science and funded about a dozen universities around the country, ones you'd recognize like MIT and Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and so on. And every year, each of the computer science departments would say to ARPA, <clears throat> you need to buy us another world-class computer so we can do world-class research. And even ARPA couldn't afford to buy a dozen computers for a dozen universities every year. So they said, we're going to build a network and you are going to share. Of course, everybody hated that idea, but they said, we're building the network anyway. So we built the ARPANET and we turned it on in 1969. It had four nodes, uh, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, SRI International, and University of Utah, which grew fairly rapidly to 40 or, or so sites. So that demonstrated that you could take different brands of computers from IBM and Hewlett Packard and digital equipment and make them talk to each other with a common set of protocols over a single homogeneous packet switch network. Okay, so that's a big milestone. And then uh, after I, my stint at UCLA, I went up to Stanford and continued research on networking and Bob Kahn, my partner in the internet design, showed up in the spring of 73. Now he had gone to ARPA by this time and they're already thinking, wow, this, internet, this ARPANET thing really worked well. Maybe we should consider using computers in command and control. Well, this led to uh, the recognition that the um, computers that we had used in the ARPANET were in fixed installations, big air-conditioned rooms. They didn't get up and move around. But if you were serious about using computers in command and control, they'd have to be in mobile vehicles and ships at sea and aircraft. Well, we had used dedicated phone lines to build the ARPANET, and you can't use dedicated phone lines to connect to the airplanes to each other or the cars. You know, the tanks run over the wires and they break, and the ships get all tangled up and the aircraft never make it off the tarmac. <laughs> so we had to, Bob, when he showed up in my office at Stanford, said, oh, the ARPANET was a big success. Now we have to do mobile radio and satellite, packet satellite and packet radio, in order to support this use of computers in command and control. So uh, he had started work on a mobile packet radio system and a packet satellite system over the Atlantic to link uh, the western part of Europe to the eastern part of the US. 
So we had three packet switch networks to worry about at this point instead of just one. And on top of all that, Xerox had the Palo Alto Research Center in Palo Alto, about a mile and a half from my lab at Stanford, and they were doing Ethernet. May of 73, Bob uh, Metcalf and uh, David Boggs introduced us to a three megabit Ethernet using coaxial cable. Uh, and of course, eventually it, gone, it went up in speeds to gigabits, 10 gigabits, 100 gigabits. So we had four different classes of packet nets to be con uh, concerned about. And our task was to figure out how to make it look like one network in spite of the fact that there were multiple of them, arbitrarily large numbers of them in any part of the world where the military might have to go. So that was the internet problem. And we called it internetworking, but that took too much, <laughs> you know, it takes too long to say that. And so by 1974, just a year later, uh, Two of my graduate students and I wrote the detailed specification for the TCP protocol, and we called it the Internet Transmission Control Protocol, and that word stuck. And so the Oxford English Dictionary credits the, uh, the request for comments documentation in December of 74, RFC number 675, with the introduction of the word Internet into the vocabulary. Did, did you see then it was going to be as big as it as it's going to be, and Scott, I mean, uh, I only asked because I looked up the numbers. In, in 1978, the world's population, 4.3 billion, and the address space, of course, right. the TCEIP is 4.2 billion. Yes, uh, actually 4.3, if you do the, the, oh, the arithmetic. You, you know, round the right way. You know, two to the 32nd, in case you want. <laughs> well, it didn't leave any room for growth. <laughs> so, well, first of all, we knew that this thing had to work on a global scale because it's going to be used for command and control for the Defense Department. They had to go anywhere. So we went through the following line of reasoning. We said, well, we just finished building this ARPANET thing and it's a nationwide scale system and it wasn't exactly an inexpensive effort. So we said, all right, how many networks are there going to be per country? And we said, well, two at least, you know, so there'd be some competition. And we said, how many countries are there? And we didn't know the answer to that. And there, wasn't, and there wasn't any Google to look it up. So, so yeah, we I guessed. Had Google, so that's, yeah. that's the question. Well, so we guessed at 128, because that was a power of two, and that's what programmers think in. So two times 128 is 256, so that takes eight bits to represent which network you're on. And then we said, okay, how many computers per network? And we thought, ah, you know, go for it. 16 million computers per network. And remember, computers at the time were million dollar devices in the air conditioned rooms, blah, blah, blah. But we figured, you know, they'll get smaller and there'll be more of them. So uh, that's 24 bits of host address plus the eight bits of network address. So there's 32 bits of address space. And you're right, if you do two to the 32nd, it's about 4.3 billion. And that was sort of close to the population of the Earth. So we thought, surely that's enough to do an experiment. And it was. Uh, and I thought, after I moved to Washington to run the program in 1976, that if this all worked, that we would then do a production version of the system. So I was sitting back thinking, you know, if we would understand more deeply how much space would be needed. Well, that didn't quite work out the way we thought because <laughs> around 1989, the network escaped the lab and became commercially available. And, and, and not in any small part to my pushing for that outcome because I really wanted the rest of the world to have access to the system, not just the computer scientists, the academics, and the military. So uh, the system is, you know, takes off in the commercial world, still using the 32-bit address space. So by about 1992, we realized there's this massive proliferation of networks all over the world. It's, it's not hard to create another Ethernet, for example, in various campuses. And there were, there were commercial and, and government-sponsored networks are happening all over everywhere. So we say, OK, we know we're going to run out of network address space. So we spent four years, in this case the Internet Engineering Task Force, designing a new protocol format for the Internet protocol layer of the system. We called it IP version 6. The previous one was IP version 4, and in case you wonder what happened to IP version 5, that was for video and audio conferencing and it didn't work, so we abandoned that. <laughs> and we went on to the next number. 128 bits of address space is um, 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. And so I thought, 
that everybody would instantly see the utility of having the larger address space, or have larger numbers of networks and large numbers of devices that were getting smaller and smaller. It, and so and the answer is nobody bothered to implement IPv6 because they said they hadn't run out of IPv4 address space. And I said, but it's obvious that we're gonna need it. And they said, nobody's asking for it. So for the last 22 years, I and many of my colleagues, including some of them here uh, in Australia, Jeff Houston in particular, uh, who was one of the founders of the uh, Australian Academic Research Network, RNET, have been pushing. And so we're about 30% penetration now. But eventually, V4 is going to have to go away because we've run out of those addresses. They're not available anymore. And so people are trying to buy and sell 32-bit addresses when they could be getting 128-bit addresses for practically free. <laughs> so there's one calculation that, uh, that Bob and I messed up. But at the time, uh, we didn't realize that we should have been shooting for a much larger address space. Anyway, they're running in parallel now, so at least you can rest easy. There's a place to go when you need all those devices for the hundreds of IoT things you have at home. So you, you mentioned that you were very keen to, to get the internet to be commercial. I remember when I started as an undergraduate back in the 80s, there was this real ethos. You shouldn't do anything commercial. It would spoil the place, and, and it was not allowed, and people would jump up and down and oh, well, berate you. Loudly. Yes. But, but you had a different vision. Well, uh, I can tell you how this came about. Um, I had a good friend, I have a good friend, whose name is Dan Lynch. He started a, an organization that he called Interop for Interoperability. It was a, uh, essentially an exhibition and training uh, service about how to build and operate and acquire pieces of uh, internet technology. So uh, this uh, uh, exhibition started around 1986 and a few hundred people came by 1988, 50,000 people showed up in San Francisco at the Moscone Center uh, for both training programs and you know, learning new things about what you could do with the internet protocols and also demonstration of equipment that was available commercially. So I remember walking in to the exhibition hall with Eric Benamou, who was the CEO of 3Com, a company that Bob Metcalf had started, uh, and that was confronted with a Cisco Systems two-story uh, display, and it, uh, it, was, it was enormous, and I just stopped and I turned to Eric and I said, Eric, how much do those displays cost? And he said, quarter of a million dollars. And this is like 1988 when that was, you know, that was a lot of money. And he said, that doesn't count the cost of the people who were manning this thing for this display area, for an exhibition area for a week. So I just stood there you know, with my jaw dropping thinking, my God, some people think they're gonna make money out of this. And then I thought, how are we ever gonna get the internet in the hands of the general public? Because up until that time, as you say, the academics and the, uh, and the military said, no commercial traffic on the internet backbone is purely for academic work or for military applications. And so I wanted to find a way to break that uh, barrier so in 1988, I asked permission to connect a commercial electronic mail system called MCI Mail up to the internet. And my, I went to what was called the Federal Networking Council, which is the policy making body at the time for the use of internet, asking if I could experiment with this internet connection to see if this commercial mail service could actually work with the rest of the internet electronic mail system. And of course, my real reason for doing this was to break the barrier to allow commercial traffic to flow on the backbone. So they said yes. And so a year later, we turned on this connection between uh, the uh, commercial email system and the internet. And within a couple of months, all the other commercial email service providers said, wait a minute, these people can't have, from MCI, can't have this special position. We want to be connected too. So CompuServe got connected, and Telemail got connected, and OnTime got connected, along with MCI Mail. And there was a little side effect. They were, used to be completely separate enclaves. You, you, had to, you could only communicate with somebody else who had an account on OnTime or, uh, or Telemail or MCI Mail. Uh, but since they all met the internet standards for message passing, suddenly everybody in their service, uh, services could talk to each other through the internet, which sort of shocked them all. Uh, but the next thing that happens in that same year, in 89, three commercial internet services pop up. One was called UUNet, one was called 
PSI net for Performance Systems International net, and one was called SurfNet in San Diego. So we had commercial services pop up, and we never looked back. Vice President Gore uh, helped to pass legislation to uh, legitimize the use of those government-sponsored backbones for commercial traffic. And that just accelerated the whole process of getting internet into commercial hands. So the other thing that then accelerated it was the, the layer that was built on top, the web. So when, when was the first time you saw a web browser? Did so, you see the potential? Uh, actually, I didn't. This is really interesting. Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN, I'm sure you've all heard this story, uh, where he was doing this little experiment with what he called the World Wide Web, and he wasn't getting any support from CERN. CERN will not tell you that right now. I was just there a couple of weeks, no, <laughs> well, a couple of months ago, and of course they proudly say home of the World Wide Web. But at the time, it was a Skunk Works operation. He gets this thing up and running on Steve Jobs' next machine and announces it, and nobody notices. Except for several people, a couple of them at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications in the middle of a cornfield in, uh, in Illinois, in Champaign-Urbana, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina. And they take one look at this thing, and again, Skunk Works operation. My friend Larry Smarr was running NCSA, didn't know anything about what these guys were doing. They invented a graphical interface for their browser, which they called Mosaic. And they released this thing around 1992. Everybody notices because the internet suddenly looks like a magazine with formatted text and images and eventually streaming audio and video. A guy named Jim Clark, who had started um, a company called Silicon Graphics, which was used to do really fancy computer-generated imagery for movies and things like that, saw the Mosaic browser and it clicked for him. He went to NCSA and he dragged Andreessen and Bina and a few others out to the West Coast, U.S. West Coast, to Silicon Valley, and they started Netscape Communications. Netscape uh, starts releasing its product, its browser, uh, around 1994. And of course, it gets a lot of attention. I was at that point working for uh, MCI again, and we bought $7 million worth of licenses for the uh, Netscape uh, Navigator uh, system in order to build a shopping mall in 1994. We were a little ahead of our time. <laughs> uh, so then they went public in 1995. The stock went through the roof and the dot boom was on. Everybody in venture capital land was throwing money at anything that had anything to do with the internet. Uh, and of course that sort of uh, blew up around April of 2000. We had the dot bust after the dot boom. But the internet kept growing at exponential rates. So uh, what, what happened there was really dramatic. And I remember being astonished as the World Wide Web takes hold, especially with the commercial uh, versions uh, like Netscape and Navigator, uh, people had uh, knowledge that they wanted to share with other people. And they weren't even asking to be compensated for sharing. They just wanted to know that what they knew was useful to somebody else. I mean, it's just astonishing avalanche of content going into the internet uh, at the time. In fact, there was so much that nobody could find anything. And so now we have the rise of the, of the uh, indexing and uh, search engines, Alta Vista, for example, coming out of digital uh, in Palo Alto, uh, and then uh, Yahoo comes out uh, from Stanford University. Uh, there were others, then came Google in 1998, again, also from Stanford University, building these clever engines, not only to index the entire World Wide Web, but to help people discover relevant pages that they might be interested in. And of course, you know, now we see the, the Bing at, at, uh, at Microsoft, among others. So this thirst for information uh, was triggered in part by the huge quantity of sharing that went on, and still does. I mean, look at what, what we have now is billions of websites uh, and streaming audio and streaming video, huge investments in uh, original productions like Netflix and, and others, Amazon. So uh, it's, it's just astonishing how this stuff feeds on itself and people who see uh, the openness of the network and see opportunities to try out new ideas. And if you'll forgive me for adding one little thing here, if you take very little away from this, except for this one notion, please hang on to it because it's important for people who are doing dissertation work. When we created the internet layer of protocol, Bob Kahn and I were very conscious of wanting to underspecify 
the system to do no more than was absolutely needed to create the internet capability. And so in the IP layer, the first thing we said was the internet protocol should not know how the packets are actually being carried. So we didn't want to specialize the protocols to know it's on an ethernet or it's on a satellite link or it's on a, an optical fiber. We wanted, to be, wanted the uh, internet protocol to be insensitive to that. So if any new technologies came along, it could just sit down on top of any communication system that, that uh, was available. But the second thing we did was to make the packets stupid because they don't know what they're carrying. All they know is they have a little bag of bits and they have to move them from point A to point B with some probability greater than zero. That's all we asked. And so that meant that if you had a new application, the bits of the packets didn't get interpreted by the network or the networks. They only got interpreted by the software at the edges of the net running in the computers, which today are often in, in what's called the cloud, but it's really just a giant computer center. So the idea of not interpreting the bits while the packets were in transit meant that you never had to change the network in order to put in a new application. It was just a question of putting up new software at the edges of the net. I can tell you that that has triggered an avalanche of content and also applications on the net without having to change anything on the inside. So that brings us to the idea of net neutrality, which is also sort of fundamentally built into that structure. So, uh, you know, are we at risk of losing all of this benefit because <sighs> net neutrality is at risk now? Well, yes, I'm very concerned about this. And remember that the term net neutrality has been sort of interpreted and reinterpreted in different contexts in different parts of the world. So I don't want to try to speak to the Australian scene necessarily. I can tell you what happened in the U.S. Uh, in sort of a short uh, sequence. The original uh, treatment of internet was to just not regulate it at all, just leave it alone. Uh, and, and that was a, a decision made by the American Federal Communications Commission and the Congress agreed with this general treatment, just leave it alone, it's too early, we don't know exactly where it's gonna go. Um, however, uh, oh and I should tell you in the mid 1990s in the US there were 8,000 internet service providers because it was a dial up system you would dial up a big modem bank and then log in to use the internet. And so there were thousands of these internet service providers. But by the um, early, two, uh, early 1990s, I'm sorry, early 2000s, uh, broadband communication technology had come along for cable uh, modems, for optical fiber channels, and for uh, digital subscriber loops. Suddenly we could get tens of, of megabits, hundreds of megabits a second instead of a dial-up modem speed of 50 kilobits a second. But in order to do that, you had to have special equipment at each house, and only a few kinds of carriers could service that. So a telco, a cable company, uh, and that was it. So suddenly, any, from uh, the point of view of any particular subscriber, you didn't have much choice about getting broadband access. If you were in the rural parts of the country, you had no choice because there wasn't any. If you were in the suburbia, you had a choice sometimes of one, either a cable company or a telephone company. And if you were in a more urban part of the country, then you might actually have a choice of, of both, either a cable company or, or a telephone company. So suddenly we have broadband internet, but not very much competition for any individual subscriber. The telcos and the cable codes were regulated differently under the FCC. Title II for telecommunications, Title VI for cable. And they, both of these entities that were regulated complained to the FCC that they were both offering internet service, but they were regulated differently. And so the FCC at that time said, oh, well, we can fix that. We'll just move internet over here to Title I, which is unregulated. So they basically said, we won't regulate anything. It's just an information service. Uh, then uh, that same uh, FCC said, but it's probably important to preserve user choice in the presence of very little competition. So we want to inhibit uh, bad behaviors. So an example, suppose you're a cable company. The business you're in is delivering video, streaming video to uh, broadcast video or, or cable video, but you're also offering internet service. 
and you notice that there's a competitor over here with video content that's using the broadband internet service that you offer to your subscriber to interfere with, or let's say compete with your video uh, services. And so you decide, let's mess up the internet service just enough so that this other competitor for video uh, doesn't uh, deliver adequate quality and it'll force our subscriber back to our video services. I'm not saying anybody did that, but that was a concern that there was incentive to do that. So the FCC said, well, we should put in net neutrality rules that would inhibit this kind of anti-competitive behavior and preserve user choice in the absence of a lot of competition. So they introduced these set of net neutrality rules and then a subsequent FCC tried to enforce the rules. And they got all the way up to our Supreme Court and the Supreme Court basically handed the FCC its head saying, sorry, uh, your predecessor said this is an unregulated service. You can't enforce the net neutrality rules because you said it was unregulated. So the next FCC moves the uh, internet service back to what's called Title II, which is a communication service, in order to make it regulatable. And then they said, we will not uh, we will forbear from enforcing a lot of the Title II terms which were related to telephony uh, that was relevant back in 1934 but not relevant in, at the present time. So they, they basically had put Internet back into the communications title um, and the most recent FCC decided that was inappropriate and they rescinded the net neutrality uh, decision. They removed uh, Internet from Title II and put it back into Title I. So at the moment, there's no protection for abusive uh, anti-competitive behavior. The correct thing to happen is a title should go into the Telecom Act specific to internet, preserving the basic net neutrality rules to avoid anti-competitive behavior and, not, and nothing else. But we happen to have a Congress which is having trouble passing any legislation. <laughs> and so getting a new title uh, into the it's Telecom Act- It's distracted by other problems. Yeah, something like that. So, now, whether you have that problem, I don't know, but we should be preserving those principles everywhere. Users should have choice. They should be protected from anti-competitive behavior. And that's all that, that we're trying to accomplish. So in, in the inter interest of time, I'm gonna move you much more up to date and uh, you've done lots of interesting jobs, but now you're working at Google. Um, whose idea was chief internet evangelist? So I actually didn't ask for this title. Um, I was briefing the House of Lords in, in England and, and they asked the same question because Chief Internet Evangelist was kind of an intriguing title. And I explained to them that when I joined the company, uh, Larry and Eric and Sergey said, what title do you want? So I thought about that for a little while and they said, how about Archduke? <laughs> and, and, and the House of Lords immediately understood this. They thought that was a, you know, a perfectly sensible thing to ask for. Uh -huh. But then Larry and Eric and Sergey went away and they came back and they said, you know, the previous Archduke was Ferdinand. <laughs> and he was assassinated in 1914. And it started World War I. That sounds like a bad title. Why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? So I said, okay, I could do that. So that's what I am. <laughs> so Google's been a lot in the news recently. Um, there's been this controversy about Project Maven, this use of artificial intelligence for for interpreting satellite imagery and drone imagery. What's your take on that? So this did lead to, this is a, a military project to try to use artificial intelligence to understand situational awareness. I mean, imagine uh, drones, this, you could imagine scenarios that are non-military, by the way, in you know, safety and security situations, crisis situations, having uh, drones uh, observing uh, the area and trying to understand what's going on to identify what's in the field of view, what vehicles are present and so on. Uh, you know, what other conditions can it identify? So situational awareness is a, is a really important capability to have. Um, the, uh, the project uh, was not to do what some people thought it was to do, which was to try to identify people's facial images and then you know, shoot at them with drones. That was not what the project was about. But, it, but that was sort of overtaken by a concern for the use of artificial intelligence in military applications. So that led the company to uh, spend quite a bit of time, several uh, months, uh, certainly many weeks, 
uh, trying to put together a set of principles that we would uh, adhere to in the use of our artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. And so that set of principles has now been published. We made that publicly open. Uh, we will follow those rules, and particularly when there are applications that, uh, that arise where there is uncertainty about uh, the potential hazard of, of applying our technology, potential harms to, to people. Uh, we have, will have um, a review panel that will determine whether we will or will not pursue those particular applications. So uh, that was an important um, discussion for us to have, painful sometimes, because there were strong feelings about uh, these things. But I think it was a good thing, and we've ended up now with a very good set of rules that, uh, that we will apply for our AI stuff. So what's, what's your general take on AI? I mean, I'm, I'm personally interested because I'm a professor of AI. I've spent my life dreaming so, about building machines. So uh, my, I'm not an expert in this, although I've grown up with it in a sense, because even when I was at ARPA back 40 years ago, 1976, there was an artificial intelligence activity there. Um, I can say that I've always been a little skeptical. Uh, my experiences have always uh, led me to think AI stood for artificial idiocy. Um, because a lot of the programs that were supposed to be artificially intelligent were only weakly so. However, uh, some pretty dramatic things have happened. I'm sure you are deeply aware of this, uh, maybe even part of the, of the uh, creation of these new uh, techniques. Many years ago, uh, people tried to use uh, neural networks, but they only had a fairly limited one layer deep thing. And uh, Minsky and Pappert, as you will remember, published a book called Perceptrons that basically trashed the idea of building a computer-based neural network to emulate the way we sort of thought the brain worked. And so for a decade or more, uh, that field was ignored as being a waste of time. But there were a few people who persisted, and they figured out that, that we could now build multi-layer uh, networks, hundreds of layers deep. And that led to some very powerful results. So some of you have read the headlines about the uh, AlphaGo program from DeepMind, one of our subsidiaries in London, that played against some of the world's best players of Go and won. Then more recently, um, we had an AlphaGo Zero program, which uh, starting with only the rules of Go, uh, within something like 30 days or so, learned to play Go as well as any of our previous AlphaGo programs had. And in a few hours, learned to play chess, starting just from the rules of chess uh, and no other exposure to human games. Learned how to play chess better than any known, uh, that we know of, a computer-based chess program. And what's very curious about the uh, chess case is that there were moves being made that, that no one has ever seen before. And so it's, it's pretty clear that the machine learning mechanism discovered ways to play chess that most humans had not discovered before. So that's pretty interesting stuff. The part that uh, I'm nervous about, and I hope you are too, <laughs> is that these are brittle systems. They are very narrow. They're deep and narrow in their capabilities and they are not representative of what we would call general, artificial general intelligence. So what you and I do as human beings is take very small amounts of experience and generalize that by abstraction and model building. And that's not what we, at least I'm not aware of any programs that are really effective at that. Um, to give you a tiny example of what you do that mo machines don't, we know what a table is. We know that anything that's a flat surface that's perpendicular to the gravitational field can serve as a table. Okay, I know most people don't think of it that way, but, but that's really what's going on. Any, like this thing is flat, perpendicular to the gravitational field, and the flat surface could be used as a table. So we've already generalized all cases of flat surface perpendicular to the gravitational field as serving as a table, which could be your lap, it could be a chair, it could be a real table, it could be this stage. Think of that. In just a few little examples, we've just generalized the notion of table, even if it doesn't look like a classic table. Human beings do this really well. Computers don't do this very well at all that I know of. So turnabout's fair play. What's your take on this? And you know, do you have the same reaction I do about the generalization, the capacity to generalize, 
that a machine learning system at the moment does not seem to do. Yes, I mean, that's, that, that's why it's called artificial intelligence. It's not natural intelligence. It's not natural it's, intelligence. It's quite a different, as you say, quite a brittle intelligence. And so, but let, let, we're running short of time, so we're gonna to go to questions quite soon, so start thinking of your questions. Um, but before, as Emma mentioned in the introduction, I mean, one of the interesting things about you is all the other things you've done outside of, the, of your immediate day job. Uh, so I just want to talk a little about some of those things. So you're very passionate about preserving our digital heritage. I am. Which, which is strange, because you know, zeros and ones don't change. Uh, yes, <laughs> well, you know, that's, we don't want to propagate that misunderstanding, Toby. Every one of you that's got a mobile phone, you take all these bazillions of pictures, somehow they all seem to be there, right? They don't seem to go away, so they'll be there forever, right? Wrong, because they are instantiated in a physical medium. And the physical media don't necessarily last forever. There are people in this room, I am sure, who have five and a quarter inch floppy disks gathering dust in their you know, basements and closets and whatnot, and they can't find a floppy reader anywhere. Well, the Smithsonian or you know, one of your local museums maybe. Same problem with three and a half inch floppy disks or with CD-ROMs or with DVDs or with Blu-ray. Uh, or with disk drives whose, whose interfaces you can't find a plug you know, to connect to. So we have a big problem, I call it the digital dark age, and it is that we don't uh, curate our digital content with much care and until we realize we can't get it again, it's gone, I can't read the, the bits anymore. So I'm a big fan of trying to create a regime in which we can assure ourselves that the digital content can be moved from one medium to another so it's still readable, uh, that we are able to preserve and run old software to correctly interpret the bits, because that's another problem. Think of a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet is a bunch of bits organized in a particular way. A piece of software needs to interpret what those bits are so you can interact with the spreadsheet. If you can't run that application, because the operating systems of the day, 10 years from now or 20 years from now, don't work, then the bits are useless. And so preserving software is just as important as preserving the bits of data. And there are all kinds of intellectual property questions. Who owns this software? Under what circumstances can I run it in the cloud, share it with other people? You know, you know, what happens if a company goes out of business? What happens to the source code? The bankruptcy courts say, oh, that's an asset. You can't just give that away. And open source may help us in some respects, but there is a, a digital dark age looming <laughs> if we don't build uh, a regime that allows us to preserve that content over long periods of time. So there's the global financial crisis, the Trump era now, we've got the digital dark age. Tell, tell us about um, Coco, who's sadly no longer with us. No, it's not about what? Uh, Coco. The oh, 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 yes. Oh, this is a sad story. Well, it's a lovely story, but it's sad because Coco just passed away just a, f a few days ago. Coco was a 42-year-old gorilla, uh, but Penny Patterson uh, was at Stanford University around 1972 or so uh, and, and uh, brought a six-month-old Coco with her to see whether she could teach this uh, gorilla to sign. And so she lived with Coco and for now for four decades in the, in the end. And Coco learned to sign using American Sign Language. Uh, I wouldn't say that Coco was um, you know, as prolific as a typical human uh, ASL signer, but uh, Coco had a vocabulary that surely was on the order of a thousand or more words. And she also seemed to understand uh, some amount of spoken speech as well. So uh, I used to sit on the board of the Gorilla Foundation, which uh, housed and supported Coco. And I remember visiting Coco one day and the first thing that uh, Coco wanted me to do was to come inside her enclosure and play chase. Coco weighed 400 pounds. <laughs> a bit dangerous. I, I, dec I declined the invitation, um, but then Penny explained that Coco then said, well, would I play some music for her? And uh, so Coco wanted me to get a blade of grass, put it in between my thumbs and blow on it to make a little noise. And I'd never done that before, so it took me a while to get that to work right. And Coco was happy. So uh, I was really struck by the level of intent that you could feel coming from this uh, non-human species. And since that time, I've become very fascinated with the idea of other species, non-human species that have intelligence that we should be thinking uh, to communicate with. Uh, dolphins, for example, 
uh, elephants. Uh, it's amazing how intelligent these animals are, and they show evidence of self. They understand self. If you put up a big mirror, you will see the dolphins recognizing that, that what they're seeing in the mirror is themselves, and they do all kinds of acrobatics because they enjoy watching themselves do it. So these other animals are similar in nature. So uh, I'm also working with a team on an interspecies internet to link species together, non-human species together, to see if we can get them to communicate. And you know, we don't have a lot of time to go into that in detail, and it's still early days. But the idea of uh, getting non-human species to communicate with each other, let alone with us, is absolutely fascinating. And so that's yet another little side, side branch in the things Great. that we get okay. to do. If we could have the lights up, we can take some questions from the floor. Well, if we've got two microphones. Come to the front. Come to the front and Perfect. We'll, we'll, okay. take, we'll turn at questions and I'll, I'll look at Twitter and see if there's anything interesting on Twitter. Hi, yeah. Thanks for coming and sharing with us. And uh, thanks for you and Bob Kahn for fathering the internet. Has a little bit of LGBT feel about that statement, but it's, <laughs> it's become such an integral part of the fabric of human existence for most of humanity that after 40 years of studiously avoiding universities, two years ago I went back to do a degree course on networking. So I'm just catching up with you now. But the question is, two statements made by other people, Tim Berners-Lee, mm -hmm. he said, we, we all now have the internet we built, now it's up to all of us to build the internet we want. And Professor Lawrence Lessig of Harvard, in a different flavor, and they do to know each other quite well, said something. Essentially, he said, we screwed up the internet at its birth. Let's not screw up blockchain. Do you have an equivalent philosophy or statement in the same flavor of where we could go with this? So uh, I don't think we've screwed up the internet, so I don't yeah. agree with Tim <laughs> on that I, point. Yeah. But what I, what I will say is that it is still a remarkably open platform. You'll notice that the Internet Engineering Task Force, which has been around since 1986, continues to develop new protocols and new applications for the network. There's nothing stopping somebody from putting up another service on the network. There's no, we, we at Google don't have any ability, nor do we want any ability, to stop somebody from inventing new applications on the network. We don't, in fact, we encourage people to do that. We encourage people to build more internet, which is part of my job as a Google internet evangelist, uh, in order for more people to get access to the system and to invent new ways of using it. So I really don't buy the idea that the internet is screwed up. Uh, I'd also- Sorry, could I just, I, I, I word that wrongly when I say screwed up. I think he was referring to levels seven and eight on the OSI, not, well, not one through to six. <laughs> Yeah, you, um, okay, so this is very interesting. Actually, there are maybe more than seven or eight levels. I mean, when you get to the OSI model, well, yeah. layer seven is sort of application layer. We're getting very geeky here, so, you know, but, apologies. But, but, but uh, eight and nine are both the uh, political layer and the religious layer. And, and <laughs> those, those, those can get really complicated real fast. What, what's a 10? What's a, I don't know. I mean, well, actually, the interplanetary network uh, may help us get out to layer 10 because now we're talking about, you know, uh, alien interactions. And that's why the okay. interspecies thing is important because okay. we can practice talking to a non-human thing so when we finally encounter alien life, we'll actually know what to do. <laughs> we're getting up into hyperspace here. Uh, there's, right. there's, a, there's a great related tweet question here. Also, I'll give you this one from the Marconi Society. Tell us what we need for a secure Internet of Things. Wow, okay, so that's a long, that was a 40 minute talk, uh, but I won't do that. The, look, the simple uh, answer here is that the Internet of Things are simply devices that are programmable and also have the ability to communicate on the network. And so the first thing you observe is that uh, you are turning over to these devices, uh, to the software and the devices, a kind of autonomy that lets them act your on front your behalf. Uh, no, front door, maybe. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's whether it's the heating and ventilation and air conditioning or the security system or your oven or the refrigerator. So the first thing to worry about is the software might have bugs. So you want to make absolutely sure that it's possible to update the software safely and securely, which means you have to make sure you know where did the software come from. You have to make sure that it hasn't been altered while on its way from the source to the update and the device can be discovered and updates installed. So we worry about that. Um, 
I also worry about the fact that uh, privacy and, and uh, confidentiality are needed with these devices. Even something as simple as uh, temperature information, if you accumulate the temperature in every room in the house over a period of six months, if somebody could look at that, they could figure out how many people live in the house, which rooms are they in, what are their diurnal patterns, and are they at home or not. And if you happen to want to break into the house, you'd use that data to figure out uh, when somebody is not home. So uh, I think we have real work to do to secure the Internet of Things in a way that everybody will feel comfortable and safe about. And I launch into that um, uh, sermon uh, with my own engineers who are working on uh, IoT at Google and Nest and some of the other companies that are part of our system. And I'll say that to everybody else who's willing to listen. <laughs> okay, question over here. Hi. I don't know how much you know about Australia's NBN, which um, <laughs> I would the, characterize. That's our broad network. <laughs> I actually, if, if, uh, and you're going to say, uh, what, can, what can we do about that? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I would characterize it as an as a access subnetwork, and it uses the, the PVC model, so you're just plugged in straight to your provider. Uh, now, it occurs to me it's actually not designed with the end user in mind. It's, it's, it's been designed for ISPs and really to facilitate the existing incumbents in the market. It also hasn't had the, the benefit of an extended research slash development cycle. And I'm curious uh, what deficiencies you see in networks like that and uh, what, what alternatives uh, might be out there. I mean, I've got some ideas of my own, which happy to take offline yeah. here, but... I, well, when, when NBN was first announced, I actually uh, came in remotely and said how excited I was about the program. I thought it was fantastic that the government wanted to build this infrastructure and make it available to everybody, high-speed services uh, to everybody's home. Uh, and then, of course, the, as, as the system uh, evolved, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, I still think that it's very important for governments to do what they can to help um, to create conditions under which investment in infrastructure like this is possible. So there's a good example um, that we tried to do in, uh, in Africa, in Uganda, Kampala, Uganda. Google built a fiber backbone network for the city and then made it available uh, at wholesale rates so that retailers could sell access to the network on a competitive basis. And so I had thought that was something, I thought that was what was going to happen here. And apparently that's not quite what happened. Uh, I'm not close enough to know what, you know, what steps should be taken. Uh, but I f still feel this great desire that every person in Australia should have access to high-speed internet services. And that we have to find a way to make that affordable and make it sustainable. And I would make that same argument for every other place in the world, because that's my aspiration. So I hope there's some way to um, make that happen here, in spite of the experiences with NBN to date. So I'm afraid we're running out of time. So oh, dear. I just wanted... OK, that's because my answers were too long. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I want to say it's been a great pleasure having a conversation with you. And thank you for sharing all of those stories and all the, the many years of experience you've had helping to uh, build the internet for the world. One is glad to be of service. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>